morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be opening up God's Word and reading it to us today. Um, we have our first passage, which is Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 3, and that's page 559 of your church Bibles. So that's Isaiah 60, starting at verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Our second reading is Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 to 20, and that's on page 883 of your Bibles. So that's Ephesians 5, starting at verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among, you, there, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater and has, and has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what is disobedient, do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Well, morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming along. It's wonderful each week to see more and more uh, folk come in person. It's lovely uh, to have you back. This is your first uh, time back uh, in the flesh. Um, you may know we've been journeying through uh, the, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And um, we're in the sort of the really practical nuts and bolts uh, bit of the book. Um, and it's quite fair to say that it's, that it's quite complicated. There's lots of ethical instructions and, and how it all ties together. It's, it's not immediately straightforward. So you might be helped to follow the little outline in the service sheets. Um, if you're like me, I find it so helpful to just jot along notes um, as I go along. It gives me something also to talk about with people afterwards. Uh, so do, do do that if that's, that's of help to you. And uh, the Bible passage we're looking at, if you closed it, is on page 883. Page 883. Brilliant. Why don't I uh, lead us in prayer? Awake, awake, O Zion. Father, Lord, I want us to wake up this morning. Please wake us up. Wake us up to who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wake us up to your holiness. Wake us up to your light. Wake us up to your majesty that we might shine in the darkness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I heard not long ago um, that our Queen Mother, uh, well, that is um, Queen Elizabeth's mum, when, uh, when uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth and Princess Margaret were just little girls and they're, they're heading off to birthday parties, the Queen Mother would uh, sit them down and give them a good talking to. Apparently, she would say something to the effect of this. Okay, girls, you're about to go off to a par- birthday party, which is immense fun. But um, at this party, you're going to be tempted to behave just like everyone else. You're going to be tempted to um, uh, have a hissy fit when you lose past the parcel. You'll be tempted to throw jelly at the butlers. You'll be tempted to, to do all these sort of, thought, sort of things which all the other boys and girls are doing. But remember, boy, remember this, Elizabeth. Remember this, Margaret. Royal children, royal manners. Royal children, royal manners. You are royalty. So now behave like it. Now this is essentially the the message which Paul kicks off with in in our passage today. If you look down in verse 1, he's calling calling the, the Ephesian Christians to live out their identity, to be who they are, royal children. Just look, verse 1, look down. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now we've seen, haven't we, throughout this series, that one of the big themes of this letter is inclusivity. How literally anyone can come to be adopted as God's dearly loved child. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your background is. Simply by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross, simply by faith, you come to be desired. You come to be wanted. You come to be adopted as dearly loved children of our Heavenly Father. And this message of salvation by grace alone, it's the heart of this letter, it's at the heart of the Christian faith. But it seems as we reach chapter 5 now, it seems as if that very doctrine is being deliberately twisted, deliberately misunderstood. It seems as if certain teachers in Ephesus have begun teaching that... that, um, well, since God has done everything to save us, since we're saved by grace alone, well, that now means we've got a, got a get-out-of-jail-free card. It doesn't matter how we live. Uh, Jesus is our safety net. Jesus is our, is our eternal life insurance. Jesus is our license to sin. That they're using grace as a means to carry on living however they want to. And Paul's response to this deception is to remind the Ephesian church of their new identity. And funnily enough, this message might sound strangely familiar to us. We live in a culture, right, which is always saying to us, be who you are, be who you are, don't live a lie. This message is bombarded at us and bombarded our children all the way every day of our life. Be who you are. And Paul would go, well, yes, be who you are. He would absolutely agree. We are to live out our identity. But he would disagree with our culture as to where we are to locate our identity. Not in our uh, psychology, not in our sexuality, but in our family. Because of Christ, we read in verse 1, we are God's dearly loved children. And now our privilege and our joy is to live that identity out. Last week we began thinking about this, didn't we? About how we're to live in the truth instead of living in ignorance. This week we're called to live in the light instead of living in darkness. So let's uh, let's kick off with the negative. As dearly loved children, we must avoid the nightlife. Avoid the nightlife. Look at verse 3. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality 
or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Now we all know what the public perception of uh, Christian teaching on sexual ethics is. If you ask the average person on the street, they'll say, well, oh yeah, the Bible is just, it's, it's repressive and it's oppressive. It's generally a bad review, isn't it? Um, that's that's the, the public conception. And I've been reading this week about why that is. And, and it's funny, the seeds of this thinking in, in, in the popular society, it's, kind of, it's come to us largely because of the romantic poets. And so there's one guy called William Blake. He wrote that famous Jerusalem hymn. You may have heard of that. He also wrote this poem. Now, I've never quoted poetry in a, in a, in a sermon before. This is untrodden ground. So let's see how this goes. This is a poem called The Garden of Love by William Blake. I went to the garden of love and saw what I had never seen. A chapel was built in its midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut. And thou shalt not writ on its door. So I turned to the garden of love so that many sweet flowers bore. And I saw that it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. So according to, to William Blake and no doubt many people in our culture today, when it comes to love and when it comes to sex, Jesus and his church are here to spoil our fun. Thou shalt not. It's a big boo, isn't it? When in fact the truth is the precise opposite. Throughout the Bible, sexual intimacy is, is held up as this wonderful, good gift from our Heavenly Father. It, it's a bit like a firework. Uh, sex is, is beautiful. It, it's powerful. But if you set it off in the wrong place, it can be disastrous. And this has, in fact, been the legacy of the so-called sexual revolution. It promised satisfaction, fulfillment, freedom. But ironically, it's resulted in a lot of burns and a lot of broken homes. Because the fireworks exploded in all the wrong places. Now, I know, given how countercultural this passage is, it would be tempting for us to just write this off and go, well, that was, that was that culture then. But actually, this was that culture then too. As in, Ephesus was, was very similar to our culture today. But here, our Heavenly Father speaks to us as, as a loving Heavenly Father because He wants what's best for us. He doesn't want us to be burned, and He doesn't want destroyed homes. The Greek word in verse 3 for sexual immorality is porneia. It's where we get, get the word pornography uh, from. And it, it's a catch-all phrase, a catch-all term to describe any sex outside the married union of a man and a woman. So this includes a boyfriend and a girlfriend fooling around uh, before they tie the knot. Uh, it includes mentally lusting after someone you're not married to. It includes indulging in porn or using explicit fiction in order, in order as a form of, of sexual release. Now, I know if you are here, uh, was it three or four months ago, I spoke in great length on this topic of pornography at the evening service, and I don't want to repeat all of that talk now. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put that up on our Facebook group so you, you can listen to it again. But we need to see, don't we, all of this stuff which our Father lovingly calls us to avoid he says, not even a hint, not even a hint, because these are improper for my holy people. Be who you are. Verse 3 also forbids impurity, which may link to what Paul says later on, forbidding drunkenness, getting, getting drunk. Now, a bit like sex, alcohol is, throughout the Bible, seen as a really good gift from God. Um, I've been enjoyed looking at everything this week, what the Bible says about alcohol. I could list them all to you, how it makes the heart glad, how it helps married, couple, uh, married couples um, sort of 
relax for sexual intimacy with each other, how clearly it's integral to a very good party. And Jesus obviously turns water into wine, enables a brilliant wedding feast to, to sort of go on. Alcohol is good. But God doesn't want his holy people to ever get drunk. Why? Because it, it dulls our senses. It lowers our inhibitions. It slows our mental faculties, meaning we far easily give in to our worst instincts. Now, maybe you're surprised in verse 3 to see greed listed here alongside sexual immorality and impurity. But actually, the heart of greed, when you stop and think about it, is actually the same as the heart of sexual immorality. It's that impulse to have what isn't rightfully yours. And so given, given how generous God has been to us in Christ, it's completely inappropriate for Christian believers to hoard wealth and not give it to others. It's completely inappropriate for Christians to be envious of other people's wealth and desiring of it. Greed. Now, our Father, he's concerned not just that we avoid falling into these sins, but that we steer as far away from them as possible. So this includes, if you look on in verse 4, this includes even coarse sexual joking. Now, again, read the Bible. It's full of humor. It's full of jokes. It's full of puns. It's full of, you know, quite pointed things. But we're not to indulge in coarse sexual joking. Why? Because... Even in our speech, even the way, in the way we talk, it's possible to diminish someone's sexual dignity. To, to dismiss the, 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 the value and the, and, and the worth of purity. Now, all too often, I, I find myself in, in pastoral situations, um, in conversations where, where people ask me, well, okay, I understand what the Bible says about this, that, and that, and that, but how far can I go? But before it falls into sin, uh, so, so, so should I? Can, can I go for that drink uh, after work with that non-Christian friend who I know really fancies me? Can, can I do that? It's not sin, is it? Uh, or can, can I book that holiday uh, alone with just just me and my girlfriend? I mean, nothing in the Bible says that's wrong, is there? Um, do, do I really need to tell my spouse or, or my flatmates that I've got this massive problem with pornography? I don't have to do that, do I? And on one level, you say, well, no, you don't have to do those things. It, you know, it's, it's, the Bible doesn't, you're right, the Bible doesn't say we must do those things. We could say, well, you're saved by grace, so just go, you're free. But if you've been freed, you've been freed in order to be holy. And so pursue holiness, rather than just swinging as close as we possibly can to the very red line. It's a different way of thinking, isn't it? Now, what I, find, I found particularly interesting for me this week, and the thing which has jumped out at me from this passage, is at the end of verse 4, it, it seems as if the spiritual antidotes to all these temptations which we face, whether to sexual morality, greed, uh, impurity, drunkenness, the, the antidote, the spiritual antidote to all these things is not willpower, nor is it living in a monastery and turning off your TV. The antidote is thanksgiving. That's probably not what you or I would have guessed, would it? The answer to that is thanksgiving. And the reason is Satan tries to get us to, to focus on what it is that we don't have. Oh, I don't have that boyfriend or that girlfriend. Oh, I don't have a spouse or a husband who looks like that. Or I don't have that thing which will fulfill and satisfy me. Satan tries to get us to focus on all those things which we don't have. And he, therefore, he tries to make us think that, the Satan, uh, that, sorry, that God is a real spoil sport at denying you that good thing. What a git. That's what Satan tries to get you to think in your head about God. The antidote here is gratitude. To, to remind ourselves all that we have. Not the, all that we don't have, but all that we do have in Christ. And actually, we're going to come back to that thought later at the end of this passage. But here's why this is so important. You see, if we, if we are content 
to continue in these sorts of behaviors without any desire to repent or turn around or change. We need to see this doesn't just damage ourselves. It doesn't just damage our relationships with those people around us. It also kind of reveals that we're worshiping a very different God to the one which we claim to. Look at verse 5. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Now I know these words could do immense damage because some of us have very sensitive consciences. I I just want to be really clear here. Paul has no intention of robbing genuine believers of their assurance of salvation. Yes, we are saved completely by grace alone. Yes, we all fail in many of these areas. That's why we had our confession earlier on. That's why we do that every single week. We're all sinners, saved by grace alone. We all stumble. We all fail. However, Paul does want to rob nominal believers of their false assurance if we claim to be adopted into God's holy family and yet resist every attempt to be holy, then isn't it more likely we're worshipping a completely different God? Isn't it more likely that we have no claim to inherit these promises which we are saying are ours? Because as we heard last week, our behaviour will inevitably flow out of who or what we worship. So in our confession earlier on, Gordon took us to Psalm 115. And um, you may have missed this saying of of the psalmist. It's, It's brilliant, brilliantly insightful. The psalmist says this, those who make idols will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. In other words, we become what we worship. I've come across a, a Sri Lankan theologian called um, uh, Renoth Ramasanka, and uh, he gives some striking examples of how it is that people become what they worship. It's a lengthy quote, but listen to this. It, it, it's brilliantly observed. It's not surprising, he says, that those who worship technology eventually develop machine-like personalities, emotionally underdeveloped, shallow in their relationships, driven by a desire to control and quantify every human situation, unable to appreciate beauty and value in anything outside the artificial. Those who worship sex, on the other hand, are incapable of trust and commitment in their human relationships and hide a lonely existence behind a mask of superficial adulthood. A society in which sex is an idol is one which reaps huge social costs, for it leads to the abuse of children, violence against women, the breakup of marriages and family life, and the exploitation of the weak and vulnerable by the pornography industry. He goes on to give plenty of other examples. We become what we worship, and it destroys us. So Paul concludes his survey of the Ephesian nightlife with a really stern warning. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, these false teachers. Now, it's unsurprising, isn't it? Given the direction our culture is going in, we're going to increasingly hear many voices in our national church stand up and, and be rather embarrassed by what God's word clearly says. And what are they, what's their strategy going to be? Well, they're going to, go, they're going to emphasize God's grace and God's kindness and his mercy. And they say, look, we're all forgiven. That means we're free. Therefore, we shouldn't be so judgmental. We shouldn't be so um, prohibitive. Of, of such things, sex outside marriage, uh, think, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
that there's no need to repent of this or that or the other. Times have changed. The Spirit's leading us in a new direction. And, and it sounds so gentle. It sounds so wise, doesn't it? And it's something we really want to believe. But it is poison. They will accuse us of being divisive when we choose not to partner with them. But friends, in the midst of our darkened culture, remember who you are. You're children of light. Beloved children of the Lord. Be who you are. So friends, as dearly loved children, avoid the nightlife. Instead, live the light life. Let's pick it up again. Verse 8. Notice this change in identity which he now goes on to describe. Verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. I gather there are certain countries in the northern Arctic Circle which for a large part of the year are in total darkness. Their day is about one hour long at at most. And in the very darkest part of the year, there's no light whatsoever for 24 hours a day. It might be an extraordinarily depressing place to live. And um, the only sort of shrubbery and vegetation you can possibly find in these sort of regions, the best you can find are these small, gnarled little conifers. See, without Christ, that's like me and you. Without Christ, that's us. We are darkness. We're incapable of producing the fruit of righteousness. But but when we put our faith in Christ, it's as though we've been lifted up out of that country and dumped right in the middle of the equator in the blazing sun, in the tropical climate there. And there in that sun-soaked land of light, well, it's inevitable that being replanted somewhere else, it's inevitable that we're going to go on to bear that sort of fruit we see here in verse 9. Goodness. Goodness, which is the proactive desire to show love to others. Righteousness, which is that vertical desire to reflect God's character. Truth, the desire to not listen to the lies of the evil one increasingly we're going to naturally bear this fruit. Why? Because we're not in darkness anymore. We're not in the Arctic Circle. We are, where are we? Papua New Guinea or somewhere like that. Somewhere beautiful and gorgeous and sun-soaked and moist and perfect uh, for bearing fruit. It's it's striking, isn't it, to compare the nightlife from the light life. If if, if those living in darkness, if their concern is always, well, what can I get away with? What's as close to to sin can I, can, I, can I go without falling in? Well, the, in verse 10, the attitude of those in the light is the exact opposite. Their desire is to try and please the Lord, to consider, well, how, how can I become more and more and more like God? Very different. Verse 11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but it rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Those of you who, who are here to listen to that talk I gave on pornography will remember this, this point. But the, I think there's the instinct in each of us to try and hide our sin, to try and keep it secret and try and keep it private. And I think one, one reason for that is because we really fear rejection. We fear shame. We fear people judging us and excluding us because if they realise what I really like, if they realise what my heart is like, if they realise some of the things I might be doing in secret, although they have nothing to do with me. And that is a lie which Satan wants us to buy into because he wants to keep us isolated and he wants to keep our sins in the darkness. The big application, the big takeaway point from that that talk I gave was could you go away and have an honest conversation with someone, maybe a spouse, 
maybe a, a flatmate, maybe a friend? Could you have an open and honest conversation about your own struggles in, in this area of sexual temptation? And it's funny, I, I caught up with a number of guys after that talk over the, over the following months, and um, all of the guys I talked to who did that shared with me how wonderfully cathartic it was to get that off their chest and out in the open. Not a single one of them um, were re felt rejected or pushed away or, or laughed at by opening up honestly their heart to someone else. Every single one of them were met with sympathy, empathy, compassion, and love as they brought their sin out of darkness and exposed it to light. And it's only in the light that the gospel can, can address these issues in our hearts. That it's only in the light that we find friends who are, who are going through the same fights and battles we are, all are and help us in it. So we're told here to expose the deeds of darkness, bring them into the light, and then we, they become light. They become light. And that's very much my experience. But there's one other thing here. Our, our serious fight against these sort of deeds of darkness, they also have another effect. Look at verse 14. This is why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. When I was a teenager, uh, sort of 15, 16, 17, um, I remember now, when it, my mum would ha always have to wake me up, and um, she would always wake me up with the same phrase. She'll burst into the room, open the curtains, say, rise and shine, rise and shine. Did anyone else's parents do that? That, that exact phrase, <laughs> rise and shine. Now, I, you know, 37 years old, for the first time I've realized my mum was quoting Isaiah 60, verse 1 to me. I didn't realize. And it's a brilliant, brilliant illustration, rise and shine. So in Isaiah 60, our, our first reading, God's people of Israel, they're pictured in the midst of darkness, in the dark land. It's Babylon. It's a place of idolatry and evil. But then the glory of the Lord rises upon them like the new day sun. It's like God opens the curtains and the Lord comes upon them. And his light, which beams upon his people, is then reflected off them and onto that surrounding dark, darkened culture. They're commanded to rise and shine, for your light has come. Well, Paul takes that verse and, and he applies it to, straight away to Jesus. He says, in the same way, the glory of the resurrected Christ, he's been resurrected in us, which means it's time to wake up and reflect his light to our surrounding and darkened culture. To your friends, your family, your neighbours who are still worshipping idols. The way you live really matters. I came across a story this week of a young couple who are walking in uh, the Scottish Highlands uh, at the turn of the century. And uh, their conversation was uh, just turned to a mutual friend of theirs, uh, a young woman. And they're talking about just how, how radiant she was and something really strangely distinctive about her. And they were discussing why, why it is that that might be. And uh, they didn't really work it out. But as they continued on their walk, they, they came across the, a Scottish castle. And, um, and it was just across a river where they're walking. And the, the, the man who, who had actually grown up around this, this area of Scotland, he, he, he said to his wife, when I was, when I was a boy, um, we used to sit on this bank and actually just look at this castle at, at night time. And you can always tell by the number of lights in the windows what was going on in the castle. Sometimes it's just only a few lights, and that was just the family there. Sometimes they were hosting lots of people, and uh, there was loads of lights in there. And he said, one time they were hosting royal family. And the place was flooded with lights. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. The conversation then turned back to their mutual friend. And they, it struck them. He said, um, 
I think the only way to explain her radiant personality, the only way it can be explained is that she too is constantly entertaining a royal guest. Friends, the days are evil. The days are evil and our friends are stumbling around in the darkness. We don't help them by living the same way as our surrounding culture. We help them by entertaining a royal guest and letting his light reflect out to them. So as our friends look at us, as our family look at us, as our colleagues look at us, do do they just see the same thing which they see in everyone else? aping the concerns and and values and, and priorities of our culture? Or do they see Christ's holiness, his radiant beauty reflected in us? Now again, I, I say that, we'll say, oh, so, oh, this is so hard, because we know what our hearts are like, we know that we struggle in these sort of ways, and we're thinking, in all honesty, pretty much a mi- mixed bag on that front. Which is why we need to then carry on to the very end of this passage. You see, in order for us to keep that fire burning, we need fuel. The only way we'll avoid the nightlife and live the light life is if we're constantly being filled with the Spirit. So look at verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now at this point, we kind of expect to Paul to kind of tell us uh, about to go and read the Bibles. Yes, he's going to tell us, yes, go and read your Bibles, read the scriptures. And so the preacher now says, and this is the moment where the preacher says, yes, you need to go and work on your quiet times, have a daily quiet time. Uh, Perhaps after the service, why not talk about the passage and and, and speak the truth and love to one another? Maybe in the week, uh, take one another out for a walk and talk about scripture and pray together. And we expect Paul to say, yes, read the Bible. That's the way we know what the Lord's will is. Now, all that's very sensible, all that's true, but that's not where he goes in verse 18, is it? He says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you've heard already, the, the Ephesians, they're tempted to get drunk on wine. And what does wine do? Wine dulls your senses. It lowers your inhibitions. It makes it far easier to live the nightlife, doesn't it? So Paul says, instead be filled with the Spirit, who heightens our senses, raises our aspirations of holiness, and empowers us to live the light life. Be filled with the Spirit. Now I'm aware, like when you make that comparison between wine and the Spirit, it's very easy, to, you might be tempted to think, therefore, the Spirit is some sort of cosmic liquid. You, you can sort of get, sort of, oh, I came in here today with 20% Holy Spirit, but now I've sung a few songs, I've gone out with 80% Holy Spirit. And it, it, so like you can sort of, boop, 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 you know, sort of top up with the Spirit, and as a, throughout the week you go, boop, 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 and you sort of diminish in, in sort of spiritual liquid. It's completely wrong. Forget that. It's nonsense. Uh, The Spirit is a person. You either have him or you don't. 100% if you're a Christian. 0% if you're not yet trusting Christ. You either have him or you don't. So the issue here in this verse is not so much about how much of the Spirit you have. The question is how much of of, of you the Spirit has. Are you giving all of yourself over to the Spirit? Or are you trying to keep this part of your life away from Him? It might be things which we talked about in this passage today. It might be pornography. It might be how you relate to your, your, Christ, uh, your, your, your girlfriend or, or, or your boyfriend. It might be your relationship with alcohol or greed and how you spend your money or hoard it. The question is, are we letting the Holy Spirit into all parts of our life? Or are we keeping this percentage away from him? I think a better translation of verse 18 
rather than be filled with the Spirit, which sounds like this once and a moment thing, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Let the Spirit keep filling you. And the you there is plural. In other words, let this, let his holiness have every part of you collectively as a church. Don't shut off doors of your life to him. Don't shut off bits of your life to him. And this leads us then to singing. This is why singing is absolutely crucial to a healthy Christian life and a healthy Christian church. Now, I know some of us, we, we don't, we're not particularly musical, and we, we might think, okay, singing, take it or leave it, yeah, whatever. And we might, some of us might not too, be too bothered that for the last year or so we've not been able to sing. But these verses show us that singing is absolutely crucial, that there are three dimensions to singing, uh, internal, horizontal, and vertical. Internally, it says here, singing is the Spirit's intended way of taking these truths which we're hearing in God's Word and then sinking them down one foot, sinking them deep into our hearts, so much so that they control our desires, control our affections, control our emotions. Without singing, what we would be left with is just dry, arid orthodoxy, joyless orthodoxy. And if you look at your Christian life and, and you think, well, yeah, that's pretty much me. I believe these things, but I really don't feel them. Maybe that's why. Because with, with singing does this to us. It sinks the gospel afoot to our hearts. Horizontally, singing is the Spirit's intended way for us to teach Scripture to one another. We're not all preachers, but we are all singers. And verse 19 says, what, what are we doing when we're singing? We're not singing to God. We're speaking, we're addressing one another in heart psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Which means it is your duty to sing loudly, even if you're completely tone deaf. Yes, James Soul, it is your duty to sing loudly, even if you're completely tone deaf. Because it's three, because I love it when people are tone deaf sing and they belt it out. I'm thinking, yes, I can see the Spirit's work in them. I'm encouraged by them. It doesn't help anyone just to mumble along under your breath. Belt it out. Internally, horizontally, vertically. And, and this, is, this is what I think sews this passage together. Vertically, singing is the Spirit's intended way for us to express our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Him. And as we've heard earlier, back in verse 4, thankfulness is crucial to resisting the nightlife. If we aren't lifting up thanks and praise to God, our tendency will be to turn inwards, to be presumptuous about what we have, to be bitter about what we don't have, and envious about what other people have. But if we're singing, thanks and praise, we lift our gaze upwards. We begin to see all that we do have in Christ. Uh, we begin uh, to put into perspective all our desires for other things. We increasingly pursue God's righteousness instead of everything else. Now, the elephant in the room, of course, is the fact that at the moment we're not singing. And as I shared with uh, Gordon at the start of the service, I don't know how to close this sermon. <laughs> The punchline of this sermon is, sing! And at the moment, we're not. And there will be mixed views amongst us. Some of us think it's absolutely wrong that we're not singing. The Bible says we must sing and give all the theological reasons why. Others feel it's absolutely right we're not singing uh, out of a love for our neighbor and we don't want to give each other COVID. Um, you probably understand now the impossible decision which we as an eldership had to make a year ago when it came to these things. We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. The fact is, this is the first time in 2,000 years where Christians haven't been singing. That can't but have a massively destructive effect on our spiritual lives. However, we feel it's right that we don't sing at this moment in time, but I hope that's a massive wrench to us. That this exposes in our hearts the fact that something is deeply, deeply wrong about our spirituality at this moment in time. 
which is why we're longing this week as we unveil the road roadmap. We're longing for that day when we can sing. So we pray that the Lord will sustain us even though we can't do what it says we should be doing right here. I'm going to invite the band up. Um, they're going to get ready uh, to sing our final song. And if you look at the words in the service sheet of our final song, they're quite perverse. Lift up your voices, lift up your praise. And you're thinking, well, I can't do that. But what I want you to do as, as we sing is notice that the words, of this, the words of this song is basically this passage. Lift it out of darkness and into the light. Sons and the daughters bought at a price. We have a new identity. And whilst I cannot invite you to sing, as you stand, I invite you to maybe mouth the words, perhaps even hum the words, in order to try and sink these truths a foot deeper from your head to your heart. So why don't I uh, invite us to sing, and uh, we'll make this our our prayer uh, as we close our service together. Over to you.